Chapter 51, The Doomed Planet And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars, meteors, shall fall from heaven, and the towers of heavens, heavens shall be shaken. That's Matthew 24, 29, and Acts 5, uh, Acts 11, 20. The news of the expected downfall increased the universal terror. This predicted tempest might be the prelude to others, yet to come at any moment. None could tell when or where, and with, with it came the anticipation of far greater horrors. The moon will fall! Our world will be destroyed! went up in one dreadful cry of agony to the heavens. Had the trump of doom sounded, the widespread consternation could not have been greater. The whole Martian world presented a complete picture of that distress and tribulation among the nations, with perplexity, men's hearts falling, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming, described in the words of the Apostle as appearing in the last days of our terrestrial world. This final catastrophe might, might long be delayed, might never indeed come, no diminution of the moon's orbit, orbital velocities was yet apparent. The meteoric bombardment falling on them might be com compensated by destructive combustions and dissipations of their materials into space, thereby lessening their densities. With such reasoning as these, the astrom astronomical science sought to allay the, allay the public alarm. But scientific reasonings and probabilities were of no avail. Business of every kind, except providing the daily necessities of life, was thrown aside. Trade, commerce, internal improvements ceased. Vast fleets lay moored at the docks, deserted by their crews. The great subject that absorbed the public mind was the rejection of life and property against the dreadful protection of life and property against the dreadful catastrophes. Sixty days was the limit within which preparations could be accomplished. Imagine such a horror as this, appending over the nations and kingdoms of our globe. What facilities, what measures could we, with all our boasted achievements in mechanical sciences and machinery, adopt to protect our populations against such a terrible catastrophe? None, but um, Martians are equal to this such emergencies, the downfall of her moons excepted. The frameworks covering the linear cities, effective as they might be in shielding them from the usual annual showers, could afford no pr protection against those tremendous downpours that were to come. Neither could the underground cellars. The kingdom of Mandel Ultima immediately went to work with its gigantic and powerful machinery, engines and millions of workmen over the whole continent at points removed from the lines of expected downfall. The foundations of mountains and hills were excavated in vast caverns extending scores of miles. Thousands of deep and spacious cellars were dug all over the plains and valleys in the vicinity of the cities and towns, roofed with solid arches of metal or masonry, and covered with enormous embankments extending for miles, affording ample refuge for the entire populations, and stored with abundant supplies of food and water. Every Martian kingdom engaged in this immense work, and a great part of the surface of the planet was burrowed and excavated from equator to poles. For protection against the possible downfall of the moons, of course, nothing could be done. The planet must take its chances. These enormous masses of which Ruhansa, at the lowest calculation, weighed four trillion tons, and Aruna, ten times that weight, with the immensity, immense momentum acquired by the speed of their downfall, the solid crust of the planet could no more resist the blow than could the roof of a shed the ball of a hundred-ton Krupp cannon. The enormous, enormous heat produced by the impact would also would set those parts of the planet where they fell on fire. They would certainly drive a huge gulf or shaft 10 to 20 miles in diameter right into the very bowels of the planet, perhaps fly straight through it like a grape shot through a pumpkin. The pent-up fiery gases, incandescent vapors, the molten metals and minerals would gush out in torrents all over the surface, destroying all vegetable and animal life. 
collapses of the crust, sinking of plains and mountains, dissipation of oceans and seas into vapor would speedily follow, and the whole globe covered, converted back into its primeval, primeval geological condition of semi-fluid molten mass. Some held that the planet would be blown up, and the terrestrians witnessed at the production of an entire of a new belt of asteroids revolving inside the old one. It may all be very well for us terrestrians to complacently flatter ourselves as to the everlasting perpetuity of our own terrestrial lunar affairs, but when we see through our great telescopes, the extraordinary appearance and changes manifest on the surface of our brother world, when we see its little moon whirling around the orb at such a rate, the inner one, Phoebus, 23 times in 24 hours and 60 times nearer to it than our moon is to us, it must be confessed that the perpetuity of Mar martial lunar affairs look rather dubious in this remote future, and the same thing happens with them may possibly happen to us. "'Tis true our Luna, like many a vain and pretty woman, has been keeping her bright side towards us ever since astronomy found it out. How she behaved herself in Adam and Eve's day we know not, but she is certainly a very inconstant little coquette, calmly as she looks on lover's vows. Perhaps she may take a notion some day to solicit a near acquaintance with us, or show us her dark side, or dance around us as lively as her little Martian brothers around their own primary. Who can tell?' The inevitable results consequent upon such acts of inconstancy towards her older mother, Terra, are not well, not only well known to the astronomical world, but have been graphically foretold by the old Hebrew prophets and apostles ages ago. Asterion's recovery was hailed with universal joy. He was the only man who dared roam among the realm of chaos, and who could, amidst, amid these those terrible those terrible dangers, calculate the approach and accurately determine the downfall of these wandering clouds. But it was not to be expected that he could spend his whole life in an ether vault, playing the role of a detective on the lookout for meteoric gorillas and tramps. He was now occupied with his plans for the trip to Earth and preparing for the great emigration that might possibly take place in the universal panic, and for which the government possessed ample facilities. Immense numbers of workshops were established for the construction of fleets of ether, vault, ether vaults and airships. Schools of instruction in the science of interplanetary navigation for the captains, engineers, and assistants, young men of ability and courage being selected for the profession, all under Assyrian supervision. The ships were to be transported to earth in trains attached to the ether vaults. Arriving there, the emigrants were to embark in them and fly to their various places of refuge around the South Pole and different parts of the Southern Hemisphere. Supplies of food and water were to be conveyed. It was to be. It was hoped that their sojourn on Earth might, after all, be only temporary, until the true state and prospect prospects of lunar affairs were satisfactorily determined. Still, it was necessary to be read, in readiness for any event. The preparations for our trip to Earth were hastened. Two magnificent ethervolt cars and airships on improved patterns were made. The ships were spindle-shaped, 90 feet long by 35 a beam, constructed of the strongest combination of metals, equipped with batteries, machinery, and wings of immense power and speed, fitted to encounter the vicissitudes and dangers of aerial voyages over the Antarctic lands and seas of Earth to breast the terrible polar storms and angry billows of those regions. Their interior arrangements were commodious and elegant. The ether vaults were taken to the south, south, south Polar Station to be put in readiness for our journey. Captain Susanak, uh, an old and experienced aerial navigator with a select crew, submitted both ships to a thorough test and pronounced them the finest he had ever commanded, and that it would afford him the greatest pleasure to circumvolate the terrestrial globe with them. One, one having been selected, the ceremony of christening was delegated to the prince, Princess Salima. This took place in the grounds of the palace and was conducted with appropriate ceremonies. The captain placed in her hands a bottle of finest crystal filled with a rare and ruby wine. The prow of the ship was ornamented with the figurehead of an albatross volant and festooned with garlands, the princess standing on deck. I name thee... Navi Avelstron, or the Explorer, 
Thou shalt traverse the vast and trackless realms of space to another world. Thou shalt fly through the wind and storm, the rain and snow, the mist and cloud, the lightning and thunder. I commit thee to the charge of the great Creator. May his all-seeing eye watch over thee, and his protected protecting hand guard thee on thy perilous journey, and whence thou hast reached the, that other world, which may perhaps become the final refuge of us here, may propitious winds waft thee over thy journeys there, and bring thee in safety to thy destined ha haven. So saying, the princess broke the bottle over the prow, prow, and the wine ran down to the ground. A short prayer was said, and the ship was put in readiness for our departure. Our party consisted of Asterion and his two assistants, Vidian and Boras, the former to take charge of the second Etherbolt, Altifora, Captain Susanak, officers uh, and engineers to take charge of the terrestrial ship, Captain Fulminax, formerly of the Martian Polar Ice Fleet, two telegraphic operators, skilled airship and battery machinists, Dr. Hamaval, our renowned Leviathan driver Hartilion, Corporal John and Chronometer Jack, who positively refused to be separated from his master. I have a casket made to contain my journal notes, etc., taken during my sojourn on Mars. It is about two feet in length, elliptical in shape, its two halves united with a fine screw joint, impervious to water. It is, it is constructed of a peculiar combination of Martian metals, lighter than cork, stronger than our toughest steel. It is encased with a network of strong cords which, to which small boys are attached. Should we suffer shipwreck in our journey over the oceans of, oceans of earth, it shall be thrown overboard and perchance be picked up by some passing vessel or washed to some shore or near some seaport sea and our fate be made known to the world. Tightly corked bottles, etc., containing papers announcing the distress or loss of ships at seas, have not unfrequently been thus discovered. All being in readiness, the Duke, members of the royal household, and many friends were assembled in the grounds to witness our departure. The explorer was mounted on its platform, manned with Captain Susanak and crew. The mutual farewells were exchanged. Solimia and I were in a little arbor embowered with flowers. She plucked a forget-me-not and affixed it to my breast, struggling to conceal her emotions, and in trembling accents, May our Heavenly Father watch over and shield you from all shadows of danger, shall be, shall be my hourly prayer until we meet again. All angels bless and guard you. Our parting was almost like the final severing of hearts long united, and that beat as one. We quickly embarked. The ship arose from the grounds swiftly and flew over the city and kingdom of Mandal Utama, crossed the equatorial ocean, the lands and seas of the southern hemisphere, and by evening of the following day reached the South Pole.